Thank you so much. And thank you to the Perina Institute for having me today. So I'm going to try to bridge the gap a little bit um, for you here from this morning of talking about dysbiosis and the microbiome um, and putting it linked with obesity. Um, but before I can do that, I really want us to be on the same page at what a huge health concern this is for companion animals. So. We're going to start out by talking about the obesity epidemic. We're going to specifically look at the role that microbes play in obesity. And then I'm going to introduce a topic that I, I like to call microbiome medicine. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with that, but you will be after today's talk. Specifically within microbiome medicine, we're going to talk about fecal microbiotransplantation, or FMT. And then at the end of the talk, we're going to talk about the SLIM studies, um, which are um, using FMT to try and manage obesity in companion animals. All right, so obesity epidemic. It's really hard to find global prevalence data on this topic. And so I, I know this is a global audience, but I elected to share the prevalence data that we have from the United States, which is where I practice medicine. And this is a huge growing problem. So about 50%, 56% of dogs and 60% of cats are considered to be overweight or obese in the United States. That equates to about 43 million dogs and about 35 million cats. And so obesity is really considered to be the most common nutritional disorder in companion animals. And when we actually break this down to look at how many animals are overweight versus obese, in the canine data, you'll actually see that the majority of them, about 37%, are actually considered to be overweight. So they have a body condition score of about six to seven, compared to a smaller percentage that are considered to actually be obese, with a body condition score of eight to nine. When when we look at the felines, that's actually reversed. So we have more feline patients that are actually considered to be obese with body condition score um, defined as eight to nine. So we talked about a little bit in the previous talk about some of these factors that can influence obesity, and, and, and truly it's a, a multifactorial condition. And kind of the most two major factors that veterinarians tend to think about are the animal ones and the owner factors. So what are we talking about when we talk about animal factors? It's really looking at the genetics and breed, the neuter status and age of that patient. And when we consider the owner factors, we're talking about more of the things like diet choice or feeding methodology and practices. We're talking about the physical activity or exercise that that patient gets at home, what type of living environment, as well as the owner's attitude about weight in general. We also know that we have to factor in the owner's age and their own body composition. And so when veterinarians were asked to decide how much of obesity and, and pets that you are seeing have to do with these factors, the majority of veterinarians said that the major factors that was influencing obesity in dogs and cats actually were owner factors. But as you heard from the conversation and discussion with Dr. Koh, there's actually more to consider here, and this is where we have to add in the veterinary factors. And so you got to hear a little bit um, about this study in particular, um, but in general, there's very limited communication when we're talking about obesity with our clients. And in, um, in in weight-related conversations, they tend to be brief. You heard in the previous talk that we tend to not ask open-ended questions. We're not getting information about comprehensive diet histories. And in general, we are providing owners very limited information when it comes to obesity in general. In fact, there aren't that many veterinarians um, that actually are providing stepwise management plans in that initial conversation, or even providing the owners the why of why we need to consider this important. And I totally understand. You got 15 minutes, you got to get the owners in and out. But when we look at the data from the study, we're spending under a minute talking about this. So here we have this huge global epidemic that's occurring. I guess you could say maybe a pandemic <laughs> in, in companion animals. And we are spending a minute talking about it in cases where we should be spending an entire appointment. So there are definitely a lot of room to improve in this, and I hope that the last talk helped to highlight that and show you how you can fill in some of the gaps to that component. So why is this important? Why should we even care about it? What are the consequences of having excess fat? Well, probably the most single, single important issue for our clients is 
It is known to reduce life expectancy and decrease quality of life. That alone is an amazing opportunity that you could leverage to explain to a client why this matters. There are many others. I'm going to put them all up here for you. So chronic inflammation, predispose, um, predisposition to orthopedic disease, kidney dysfunction, or lower urinary tract disease disorders, respiratory disorders, even increased cancer risk, metabolic and endocrine disorders. The list goes on and on about why we need to consider excess fat as an actual disease and not ignore it. All right. So once I've identified the problem, and now I'm going to be committed after the last talk of how to approach that conversation with my owners, what options do I have? And we just walked through a great kind of initial conversation of what to do. But really, that factored around two things. One, feed less, or essentially change the diet. Two, exercise more. So feed less, movement. That's it. That's all we have to offer, right? So this got me thinking, well, is there anything else that we could offer as a potential to expand what we have for this patient population? Well, one of the big things is the evidence that you just saw shows that we're doing a bad job taking histories and trying to integrate that in. So that's one area where we can definitely improve as veterinarians. But really, is there anything else? Well, that's where the role of the microbes come in. So obesity is a really complex and multifactorial disease. I've listed a variety of categories here for you that are impacted um, in obesity. So diet, I think that's pretty easy for us to understand. Energy expenditure, um, so if you have a dog who's a couch potato, that's going to be totally different than your athlete or high performance animal. Genetics plays a large component. Their overall metabolism, so not all dogs have the same metabolic potential, and so that's something that we need to consider. Behavioral factors here, and this goes back to the catch potato versus super active, or even have to do with the owner's activity. So if this is a dog that's going to agility training with the owner and that's a bonding experience for them, that's gonna look totally different than my dogs that are staying at home sleeping and snoring on my couch. <laughs> Environmental exposures is a big important factor to consider. And then lastly, growing evidence that the gut microbiome actually plays a really important role in this disease. So probably the two most important for this group to think about is the dietary component and the gut microbiome. And this relationship by just taking these two factors is extremely complex. So we know that if we feed less or change the composition of the diet, we can have an impact. And so this is a bi-directional relationship. It is complex, but in general, we know how to manipulate this really well. We also know, and there's growing evidence, that the microbiome plays a, a large role in this. And I'm going to show you evidence today where this relationship could potentially bi be bidirectional, where microbes could actually be um, it resulting in obesity, or it could be that underlying conditions are changing the microbiome that could lead to a more susceptible state. But one component that we often forget about <laughs> is the connection between what we feed our pets and what that's doing to the microbiome. So we talk about, okay, we're gonna feed a certain diet to an individual patient, and you're thinking about the outcome of the patient. That's how I was trained as a veterinarian. But now, I actually look at that diet, not only what is it giving to my, the pet that I'm feeding it to, but how are those nutrients being used and consumed by the microbiome? And those interactions are also extremely important for us to consider for our patients. All right, so for the rest of today's talk, we're really gonna focus just on this, the microbiome component. So we know that dysbiosis is present in dogs and cats, and there are growing and growing um, number of studies that show that in obese pets, um, we, we can see this obesity or see this dysbiosis, excuse me. And this morning, Jan gave you guys a great overview of the microbiome in general. And I, I know if you're not used to looking at microbiome, this can be really overwhelming. So what I've listed here in the blue is the five major phylum um, that we tend to talk about when we're talking about this ecosystem. And then under there, I've listed some of the more common species that you may be more familiar with. Um, and we're gonna start by just looking at the canine information. 
So we know in dogs that are obese that we can see an increase in firmicutes and we see a decrease in the bacteria deets. And this, act, this change in microbial composition correlates with body condition score. We also know that in some studies, we can see an increase in the proteobacteria. And in general, it's been hypothesized that because of that alteration, there is more LPS that's there, and that may be a component that's triggering chronic inflammation. We also know that this is really complex, and that sex, breed, and even lifestyle are gonna play a role into what changes we see in the microbiome. We also know that there's a high amount of variability between dogs, so it makes it really hard to say this is the exact pattern that we're gonna see in an obese pet. We have to think that and consider that there is gonna be variations between individuals. So we do have a single study right now that's been very helpful um, of looking at dogs when they're obese and after they've gone through a weight loss plan to look at what's happening in their microbiome. And interestingly enough in that study, we see that there's a reversal in that dysbiosis. So those firmicutes that have been high actually with weight loss decreased and there's that reverse relationship with the bacteria deets. And so by achieving weight loss in canine patients, we we do see that we're able to reverse that dysbiosis, which is really interesting. So cats are a different story. In vet school, I always learned that cats are not small dogs. That is definitely true in the microbiome space. So when we look at the data that we have available for cats, it, it's, it's even less in this space. Um, but you'll notice right away that actually the relationship is inverse. So here we see firmicutes, um, specifically uh, Pepto, Strepto, Caucasiae to be decreased, and then an increase in bacteria deets, with Provotella being one of the more common organisms to be increased. There was a wonderful study that came out of Auburn this year. It's a metagenomic study, so it allows us to actually look at individual species, so not just a census of kind of broad categories of microbes, but really to dive into the weeds about what individual organisms are making a difference. And they looked at obese cats using um, metagenomics, and they were able to identify what they call an obese um, microbiota signature. And so you can see here that in the other studies, I've listed kind of broad um, increase and decrease in arrows, but in this study, we're able to get more precision in what we're actually looking at. And you can see in the firmicutes, it's complex. There's an organism that's high, there's a couple that are low, so it's, it's not as easy as just saying these major categories are increasing and these other ones are decreasing. It's, it's much more complex than that. We also have a single cat study um, where cats who were obese were fed moderate protein, high fiber diet, and we did see a similar reversal in the dysbiosis. So instead of having an increase in bacteria deets after weight loss, that decreased, and they had an increase in actinobacteria or bifidobacterium. So, Hopefully this shows you that definitely we see dysbiosis in the gut in pets who have obesity. And so the question then becomes, could microbes be making our pets fat? And I bet there's a lot of you in the audience saying, no way, there, that is absolutely impossible. But hopefully after today's talk, you'll think, yeah, actually that might be possible and something that we need to consider. So in 2000, 13, there was a really foundational study that occurred. And in this study, they had twin cohorts of humans, and they had four of these twin cohorts. One twin was thin, one twin was obese. And they took fe fecal samples from these twins, and they actually fed it to germ-free mice. And in doing that, they were able to transmit the phenotype of obesity to the mice that received fecal content from the obese twin. So let that sink in for a minute. They were able to take feces from a human and transmit the phenotype of obesity to a mouse. That's huge. And the graph here shows you that mice that were colonized with all lean donor feces had essentially no weight gain. And when you look at um, the mice that got feces from obese twins, it was about a 10% change in fat mass, a huge amount. So this group went on to say, oh man, I mean, clearly microbes are playing a really, really large role in obesity. 
What if we give mice fecal transplants? Can we rescue that phenotype? So mice are inherently coprophagic, so if you house them together, they are constantly eating each other's feces and giving each other FMTs. And so in the first bar, these are all obese mice in a cage, and you see they all stayed fat, about 10% excessive fat. When we put all the lean mice all together, you can see that all of them stayed about the same. But now all of a sudden, when we combine obese mice with lean mice, they're not as obese. So there was a change in that phenotype. And so instead of gaining 10% excess fat, we have reduced it to about two and a half. So a huge amount, and being able to change that phenotype by introducing lean microbes to those obese individuals. And when we, had, um, when we look at the lean individuals that were there, we actually see that even though they are eating feces from those obese um, mice, we don't see that they're gaining an excessive amount of weight. And in the end, the researchers were able to correlate um, these changes with a bacteria DEET and found that there was an uh, invasion or engraftment of a bacteria DEET from the lean microbiota into the obese background that made the biggest difference. And it was diet dependent. So we're, we talk about these things in a vacuum, but diet here made a really big difference. So if those obese mi mice were fed a low fat, high fiber diet, they didn't they had a reduction in the amount of fat that they gained. But if they were fed a high fat, high fiber diet, that phenotype of rescuing them didn't happen. So diet and microbes play a really important role in obesity. So what other evidence do we have? So that's in mice, like how, how common is this, right? So Clostridioides difficile is treated with fecal microbiota transplant, or FMT. And in 2015, there was a case report that came out that really shocked the FMT community because a, a woman who had C. diff was treated with, with an FMT. Thankfully, she cleared her C. diff infection. Unfortunately, she had new onset of obesity. And so that terrified the community that we had actually transmitted a phenotype of obesity to, um, to a human. And when they went back into the data, they could track back that the fecal transplant that she received was from a donor who was overweight. And so now, when fecal transplants are happening in humans, body composition is taken into account because of the potential for transmitting a phenotype of obesity in humans. So the next question then becomes, well, how could this be happening? Like, why, why could you transmit obesity with just the microbes? And Jeff Gordon's group did a really interesting paper where they got into very specifics about those microbes. And they found that in obesity, the microbiota actually harbor very unique enzymes and transporters. Those enzymes and transporters allow for undigested carbohydrates and proteins to all of a sudden now be able to be digested and thus be available to the host. And so all of a sudden now we have all these excessive sources of nutrients that can can be absorbed, and that leads to an increase in energy intake. So the microbes play a really key role here, and actually, you would think, man, like, it's got to be what they're eating, they're just eating too much. But in this case, essentially what this means is I could eat the exact same thing as a colleague who's overweight, and my microbes are going to take that diet and handle it totally different than someone who's overweight. They're going to have access to nutrients that my body isn't going to even see. So microbes play a huge role in this. So this led me to start thinking about, well, how could microbiome medicine help? So I'd like to introduce you to this concept. So this is the idea of taking a therapeutic that targets microbiome health in order to confer a clinical health benefit to the host. This is using microbial um, components to treat a disease or to alter that ecosystem. And I truly consider this to be the next frontier of precision or personalized medicine.
So we talked a lot this morning about dysbiosis. It's important to remember that it's not just the change in the overall structure of that community, but also their functional abilities. And the list is growing and growing of diseases where we see a dysbiosis and obesity. We've reviewed that data. It's definitely on the list. So as a veterinarian, you have to ask yourself, well, how can I reverse obesity and get back, or a reverse um, dysbiosis and get back to a healthy state? And how does that relate to obesity? So there's many different ways to restore the gut microbiota. You could use very targeted um, antimicrobials, but we talked this morning about potentially the widespread and long-lasting impacts of antimicrobials on the microbiome. You could use prebiotics, which are essentially food for microbes, or probiotics. In humans, a lot of biotech companies are engineering microbes to have very specific functions that are lacking in certain diseases. Symbiotics just combine prebiotics and a probiotic into one single um, product to give. Phage therapy is, um, is much newer, so this is the idea of using bacteria phages, so viruses of bacteria, to be given to a patient to really alter and change and essentially design their microbiome by killing off certain members. Fecal microbiota transplant, where we take feces from a healthy donor and put it into a disease recipient. And postbiotics are essentially microbial metabolites that we could just give directly in order to have a function. So we're going to focus on FMT. So what is it? So I've, I've said it already, but it's the transfer of feces from a healthy donor to a disease recipient. The goal is to modulate the intestinal microbiome, and we always talk about the bacteria, right? Well, they're the easier things to study. They're there in high abundance. Molecularly, we have a lot of tools for them, but we cannot forget that this ecosystem is very, very complex. So in there, we're talking about archaea, protozoa, Fungi, bacteriophages, or viruses. So today we've talked a lot about the bacteria, but we need to remember this is a whole ecosystem. There are many ways to give an FMT. So using a fecal slurry and giving it via enema or endoscopy are common methodologies. Capsule endoscopy is becoming more common as well. Um, you can use a fecal slurry that then is frozen and encapsulated or lyophilized freeze-dried feces. If you put it into a gelatin capsule, it gets released in the stomach. Um, if you use delayed release capsules, you have the potential to get the microbes closer to where they need to be in the large intestine. But there's many different ways that we can um, get, get, the get the microbes where they need to be. And we know that these microbes are essential for health. They help to extract energy from our food. They're essential for, um, for us to help produce certain vitamins, regulate our immune system, regulate glucose and metabolism in general, and they're important for colonization resistance against pathogens. So there's a ton of power in poop. And there's many, many ways that this could happen. And we talked about some of those this morning. But one thing that I just want to highlight to you is that microbes are not just sitting there eating nutrients in your environment, in their environment. They are making metabolites. And those metabolites are getting absorbed by the host and they are going all throughout the body in order to, to change and signal to the host what they need to do in relation. So we talked a lot this morning about short chain fatty acids and secondary bile acids. These are two of the more common ones that you'll see, but there's many, many microbial metabolites that have broad-reaching impacts. So when we think about on the human side, well, what do we know about using FMT for obesity? Like, can we actually do this? Can we take feces from a lean individual, put it into someone obese, and make them thin? And there actually are a few pilot studies that have looked to do this on a small scale. One study actually found that they saw a decrease in insulin resistance, so better insulin sensitivity. in patients after an FMT, it had to do with butyrate-producing bacteria. We also have um, evidence that oral FMT is safe, it's well tolerated. Unfortunately, in this study, it didn't change the BMI, but the obese individual had a microbiome that was starting to look more similar to the lean donor. And we know in a more recent study that bacteria from lean donors can engraft in an obese um, human, but they didn't see any clinically significant metabolic benefit. But there are 19 ongoing studies right now looking at using FMT for obesity in humans. So we have a lot to learn in this space. 
So this brings me to finish up here on the SLIM studies that we have going on at The Ohio State University College of Veterinary Medicine. So when I started at OSU and I had looked at all this data and I was worried, I'm an infectious disease background, so I was worried about an, a, a disease like obesity that isn't assigned to a single pathogen but could be transmissible by microbes, I started thinking about, well, how could we modulate the microbiome in order to uh, confer a health benefit in this disease? And this is what led us to the SLIM studies. So the American Kennel Club, Canine Health Foundation, and Purina have generously supported our Canine Slim um, project. My two fellows are noted here, Dr. Nealon and Dr. Klein. We took um, feces from lean donor dogs, multiple lean donor dogs, and combined them. We then administered them to obese dogs, and this is actually our experimental design. So we have three major groups. The first group here in the gray just gets a standard weight loss management plan, similar to the one that we just discussed in the previous talk. They all go on OM. Dr. Valerie Parker is our board at nutritionist, and she gives each individual dog a weekly personalized weight management plan with the goal of losing 1% to 2% of body weight per week. This happens all the way to week 12, and then after that, we let them go on their current calories that they're consuming, and we watch what happens to their weight over the last 12 weeks of the study. In the middle column here, these dogs get a high-dose oral FMT to begin with, and then weekly FMT for the first 12 weeks. After that, they get switched to a placebo. The goal of this is that we can see how long those lean microbes are actually, um, are actually staying and grafted and whether they're having an impact after we start, stop giving them. And then the last group is um, getting a placebo to start and then at week 12 they switch over to an FMT. And the goal here is that if an obesogenic environment is hostile to lean microbes, they might not be able to engraft. And so this group will allow us to see if there's better engraftment once we've started to achieve weight loss in these pets. And I'm sure a lot of you don't believe me that our dogs take these really readily, but this has been one of our clinical trials patients. That is a meatball filled with poop pills that Dr. Klein is giving him, and he is so excited. <laughs> they come in every week when they're getting FMT. We monitor their weight every week. We also, at the major time points that are listed there, so about every three weeks, we take comprehensive sampling from them. And this study is a multiomic study, so we're looking at microbiome and um, metabolomics as output. Points. So it's in progress. We actually just finished um, the clinical trial portion. We are starting to unblind ourselves and start the analysis phase. But I wanted to share a patient of ours. This is PAX. Um, PAX, you can see, had a great trajectory for weight loss. In the end, he ended up losing about 23% of his body weight, um, which is wonderful over a 24-week um, time period. And he finished in the summer last year, and so we joked with the owners that he had his beach bod ready to go. Um, but this has been a really rewarding study because every single dog in the study has lost weight. And the owners are thrilled, the dogs are doing great. And so now I get to put my scientist hat on, and we're going to jump into the microbiome biome portions of this. So I always, um, I always get asked, you know, well, do you think it matters whether it's capsule or enema? And the answer is I don't know, but in this study we elected to use capsule. The other question I get is, what about all the fat cats? Why are you forgetting about all these fat cats? And so um, we have a study, a, a feline slim study, that is um, sponsored by Morris Animal Foundation and again, Purina. And in this study, it looks a little different. So we have that same treatment group, the control group, that's just gonna get switched to OM um, for the 24 weeks. And then we have just an FMT group. And in this case, we're using enema in these guys to start out with and then they actually are gonna go home with lyophilized FMT to be given on a daily basis. Um, and again, we're assessing all the same parameters. They're actually getting weighed at home um, because they can't come in to see me um, every week in order to, to do that. Um, so um, they'll have a scale at home and we're collecting feces throughout to do multiomics on these guys as well. And so we're launching this study actually when I get back from this conference. So I hope that this talk has provided you with an opportunity to really think about the 
obesity epidemic that we're all facing and only starting to discuss. I hope it's made you pause and think about the role that microbes play in this. And if you didn't know before this talk, now you know a little bit more about microbiome medicine. Specifically, you know about FMT and about the SLIM studies that we have ongoing and how they're gonna contribute to this area. So I'm very excited as a um, microbiome researcher that we are really on the edge of a new era. And when we think about this for our, pe our pets and how it means that we will be able to provide personalized microbiome medicine, this is huge. With central components being diet and nutritional management, the microbiome factors of all those ways that we can manipulate the microbiome, and also the host factors. And so I hope today you walk away with realizing that this is a really complex ecosystem. And in fact, we should be considering it an organ system and teaching it to our veterinary students in that manner. I hope you're starting to think about microbiome medicine or at least question it a little bit more. I hope I've shown that microbes are important in obesity and that the SLIM studies are gonna help to expand our knowledge in this area. And then lastly, I want to tell you about a new international group um, known as the Companion Animal FMT Consortium. This is a group of 18 different institutions right now that are performing FMTs in dogs and cats. We are working together to come up with a set of practical clinical guidelines to help veterinarians decide how to use FMT in their practice. And these guidelines will be coming soon. So thank you so much for your attention.